All right, now we get to play with or talk about playing with toys. So anyway, here's a nice thing about uh, fun things you have to worry about when you're doing any kind of advanced airway procedure. People coughing, spitting, vomiting, biting. So big thing here they always want to try and emphasize with you guys is make sure you wear gloves and face shields. A lot of places are actually kind of issuing out eye protection just for that. I mean, you know, I mean, you really just don't know where they've been. You know, and I'll even be first to admit I'm really, really bad when it comes to this because I'm still that. Oh wait a minute, we just did it without eye protection all the time. We're just like that though. Or and I can remember one time actually nasally intubating somebody and went down the esophagus and all this stuff came up and my first reaction was put it like this and it shot up and hit my partner. It's kind of funny. So there's some little tricks. Uh, a respirator, uh, airborne diseases, which is kind of the big one we have to worry about. TB. TB. Always got to kind of keep an eye out for TB, you know, especially uh, if you guys decide to go work down south and you're working with homeless and stuff like that. You guys ever listen to TB lungs by chance? Anybody? You, you ever, is there, uh, what are those called? Maracas? That's what TB, TB sounds like. That and a couple other strange sounds. I mean, it's horrid. And I just remember the last time I had a TB patient, my, I mean, my partner was all fascinated by this. Dude, you got to listen to this. I'm like, no, put a mask on her or something. Did you have to actually listen to it? You'll listen to it. Well, the problem with TB is that it actually does create little, it isolates the, uh, the bacteria and encapsulates it. So it actually really is rattling in there. No, don't do that. You don't want to get too close to that. Okay, things we're going to talk about real quick is gastric tubes. Um, I think I did a gastric tube once, and that was basically because it was I was in an internship and we were in a cardiac arrest and we had a long time. I was like, anything else you want to do? Want to try? Try an OG tube. Why not? But a lot of times, uh, OG tubes, again, we're actually trying to, if you have to worry about issues of gastric distension, like I said, those more long transport times are actually pretty good for that. Uh, I've seen some people give NG tubes just because they drank too much. That was actually pretty interesting to watch, and they sucked all that beer out. I, I was weird. I, I, the guy even, you know, it was weird. The guy even called. He got an order from the doc too, and he was like, "Yeah, sure." And guys, just he drove up, opened the guy's just sitting there back in the captain's chair, and he's just sitting there tube. But um, understand with a lot, of, especially the. Uh, facial trauma issues, we don't want to stick anything in the nose. Just understand the whole reason why we don't do that was because of some yo-yo. I mean literally in 1975, who wasn't even intubating, or doing, but he actually got an NG tube and he forced this thing so hard, you can still see the picture, it always gets passed around of you know the NG tube wrapped in this guy's brain. You know, it was a big facial you know trauma injury, but because of that, we don't, obviously we don't do NG tubes, but also said don't do nasal tubes on any kind of facial or you know skull fracture at that point. Can you insert those? I mean, can't you, like, if you can see, like, in the mouth or something, can't you see them? Just pull them down? The esophagus? Yeah. I mean, down your back to the well, a lot of times with the, uh, when you do with the OG tubes, a lot of times you intubate them first, and then once you intubate them, you've got that. Why, well, you have the scope in there? You no. Into the not even that much. Once you intubate them, you got that tube, you've got it all sealed off, just slip it down. It's not going to go into the trachea, that's already sealed. So, it'll just, eventually, it'll just go right in the stomach and. Hooked up the section, listen, gurgle, gurgle, gurgle. Now, I can tell you this much, back in the day when we were a not so nice and kind or gentler EMS world, I remember bringing people to the hospital. These people would just be blatantly intoxicated, and the ER would actually put them down on four points, and they'd do it that way, and they'd do it. You guys are familiar with the lavage? Mm -hmm. You know, of lodge, they put saline in, they would draw it out. Saline in it would draw it out, and these guys would sit there and be fighting. I mean, it was pretty. It was pretty, you know, hardcore. Like I said, things have changed now, you know. But anyway, uh, esophageal disease, obviously, we, if we're, you know, I think one of the questions they're talking about in the uh, quizzes were, they're talking about, you know, people with liver disease or alcoholism. What's the problem with that? Varices. Varices. Yeah. We, that's the other reason why we don't stick, like, combi tubes down for people like that. We rupture varices. They're going to bleed like a sieve, and we can't really do nothing. We can't go down and cauterize it. So we're kind of, you know, trapped with that. Disadvantages, obviously, uh, can interfere with mass seal, interfere with uh, innovation. 
uh, uncomfortable for patients. Like I said, if you're my personal thing, if you're doing an NG tube or, or an OG tube especially, intubate them first, then do the OG tube. It'd be a lot easier on you. Or even if you want to make it into an NG tube, that's fine too. But uh, NG tubes, again, uh, tolerated by awake patients, but uncomfortable, but they can speak, you know. Have you guys ever seen people with NG tubes? Or try to adjust their NG tube? It's not a very, they don't exactly find the most pleasurable thing. But yeah, you just take it back there, tell them swallow, 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 and all that. Are they much different than like the dog hogs, like people for feeding? You know the yellow ones that hang out, like the patient's nose? Uh, I think they're smaller. But it's the same concept. Yeah, it's the same concept. I don't know, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I mean, for us, I mean, you could actually feed somebody through that, but a lot of times ours is just geared for suctioning out stuff. Don't don't encourage them before you know it. we will be feeding people. Put it back in. The woman kind of ripped it halfway out, and I was sitting there, and she's just like, "Oh, she's like, swallow it." And the woman just like, "They're really bad at pulling them out on the observation unit. They're really bad. Horrible. I was the CMA on the I always wonder if people get the central lines pulled out. That's one thing I always want to watch. Because I've seen them go in. I've actually learned how to put in a central line. Pick line. Like a pick line. They get caught up in the cover and they roll over. And like, oh. Oh. You guys don't know what a pick line is? Yes, no? Yeah. Basically, a, a peripherally inserted uh, cardiac catheter. Basically, they put the, uh, like an IV goes in, but it goes all the way in, all the way to your heart. So it's sitting all the way into there. But uh, anyway, back to oral gastric tubes. Again, usually use in unresponsive patients. I mean, for the most part, like I said. Larger tubes may be used, and it's a safe and facial trauma. Because like I said, we just if we're going from here down, we're okay. But if we go back here, it's the cranial vault. That's the big issue we're about in those uh, traumatic patients. Complications, obviously, induces emesis. You, get, you're, uh, you can simulate their gag reflex, <coughs> soft tissue bleeding. Any you guys ever put in MPAs a lot? Now, you ever pulled out MPAs? How many nosebleeds did you get? They bleed all the time. They, they, like, all. Yeah, that's just remember that when you put something in someone's nose, you pull it out. It's nine times probably going to bleed. And no, those are posterior nosebleeds. Some most of the time, and those are really hard to deal with. They say like nose. They say like blood on the tube when you pull it out is like normal. Yeah. <coughs> so, misplacing the trachea, like I said, just shows you the trick around that. If you're going to do that, just intubate first. Just intubate first. Yeah. I mean, if you're, really, if they're unresponsive. And, <coughs> you know, even if they're breathing on their own, I'd be kind of, I guess the thing is, why would you, I guess my thing is, why would you put an OG tube in? You know, so, my thing, I would have, kind of have this thing of don't ever ruin a good thing. If they're breathing, their pulse is good, their respiration is good, their color is good, don't mess it up. You know, or even if the pressure is a little low, they're talking to you, their color looks good, don't mess it up. So, they usually go in uh, French sizes. Uh, if you ever want to do uh, for an NG tube, we just measure from here to here to the xiphoid. It does not wrap, do not wrap around the ear. It's supposed to be relatively sterile, but some people will try and wrap around the ear to kind of get there. Um, lubricate the end with uh, some kind of water soluble gel. Again, like I said, you just put it in. And actually, I think I got a little thing in here that shows you how to do it. So, and again, anything like an uh, MPA, insert towards the angle of jog and uh, gradually measure to the length, have patients swallow, swallow. Big thing that once you actually, after you do measure it, Get a little piece of tape or something to kind of make it a little bit marker so you just don't keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, some people are kind of like, oh, yeah, you're right, this marker. Me personally, if I can put a little piece of tape to kind of know where, okay, we're at the end. We're good. Okay. First, what you do is once you get in there, usually put up some CC, a few CCs of air, you know, then you ask, you know, you might hear some little bubbling, then you aspirate, see if you got any gastric contents, then we just, you know, secure it and we're good. And we can put our suction up to that. some sound here.
Flocan nasal gastric tube. The placement and of no, the nasal gastric tube is indicated product. for short-term gastric feeding, maximum six to eight weeks, and for oh come on, weeks and for stomach decompression. Consider peg placement in case longer-term application is necessary. Flocan nasal gastric tubes are available in multiple lengths and charriers, and are offered with or without guide wire. The tubes are available in PER, silicone and PVC design. PER and silicone tubes are more patient-friendly than PVC tubes because of the softer materials used. Preparation Prepare the following materials required for placement of the nasal gastric tube. Flocare nasal gastric tube, hypoallergenic tape, 50 ml syringe, connecting with the tube, small container with water to moisten the tube, glass of water, tape or a marker to mark the correct placement of the tube, small towel, handkerchief. Wash your hands or wear surgical gloves. Wear gloves. Placement. If possible, explain the procedure to the patient. Place the patient in a semi-recumbent position. Place a towel on the patient's chest. Measure the required length of the tube by keeping the tip of the tube at the lowest point of the sternum and leading the tube behind the ear to the tip of the nose. Yeah, don't do that. Just here, here. Mark the tube at this point with a pen or tape. Submerge the tip of the tube into the container with water. This will facilitate the introduction of the tube. Ask the patient to blow his nose. Choose the nostril through which the patient breathes most easily. Ask the patient to bend his head backwards and introduce the tube into the chosen nostril. Ask the patient to bend forwards as soon as he feels the tube in his throat. Advance the tube further and ask the patient to swallow the tube further down, potentially by drinking small sips of water. Let the patient sigh deeply to prevent retching. Introduce the tube further until the previously applied mark reaches the nose. Subsequently, Check if the flow care tube is adequately placed in the stomach through aspiration of gastric contents. Measure the pH value of the gastric contents using pH paper. The tube is correctly placed in the stomach if the pH value is below 5.5. If the measured pH value is higher than 5.5, the appropriate tube placement needs to be confirmed through X-ray. The tube is visible thanks to the radio-opaque line. Note the pH value in the patient's medical chart. Take the tube to the nose, avoiding compression of the tube against the nostrils. After assessing that the tube's placement is correct, inject 20 to 40 milliliters of water into the tube. This will avoid acidification and coagulation of the tube feed and as a consequence, will avoid obstruction of the tube. In case of using a tube with guide wire, introduce the guide wire completely into the tube prior to placement by pushing the handle of the guide wire completely into the large opening of the feeding connector. Remove the guide wire only after flushing the tube. Care. Work hygienically and aseptically. Care of the nose and mouth are very important. Change the hypoallergenic tape that fixes the tube daily. Clean the skin thoroughly. If the skin under the tape is damaged, remove the tube and place a new tube in the other nostril. Take good care of the damaged skin. Ask the patient to blow their nose on a regular basis. If this is impossible, clean the nose with saline. Even if the patient is not able to eat, it is very important to take good care of the mouth, teeth and lips. 
Check the position of the tube prior to feeding by measuring pH value of gastric contents using pH paper. At least three times a day and with each change of nursing duty. When in doubt, use x-ray to check the position. Well, you got the idea there. I uh, Just using the other nostril? Why are you worried about blowing the other nostril? So you can breathe? Otherwise, yeah, once that tube's there, there's not a whole lot you can do. So again, uh, oral here, again, select the size. Depending on, usually you'll see in your book the different sizes for the different, you know, ages and so forth. Measure the length. Um, usually say mouth, mouth and jaw down. Insert gradually but steadily. Place, you know, again, same thing. Instill or aspirate. Secure. Evacuate contents as needed. Easy thing to do. If you get a chance to do it in the ER, great. You know, like I said, it's a very, very few and far between thing you have to really ever work, deal with too much. I mean, the only, I mean, like I said, it's that person you've intubated and there's just vomit that just keeps coming, coming, coming. It's just easier to put that in there and hook up the suction and less thing you have to deal with. All right, here's the fun one. Endotracheal intubation. I'm going to talk quite a bit about this one. Okay, keep in mind about endotracheal intubation is one, statistically, paramedics only have about a 50% success rate first time, if that. Usually it's about a 40 so, that being said, is that they're always watching you when you intubate. Always, always watching you. They're expecting you to screw up, so don't screw up. I don't like to let people have that kind of satisfaction. But anyway, the point of the inter tracheal intubation is we put a tube in the trachea, obviously. We inflate the cuff, and we've got control of the airway. Okay, it's, We secure it as best as we can. It's probably the most secure airway we're never going to get. Does it mean it's perfect? No. Does it mean things can't slip around it? Possibly. Does it mean it can get dislodged? Absolutely. So just understand we're in a very uncontrolled environment, and if it can move and break and fall apart, it will. So anyway, again, we put the tube in. We can attach it to the BVM. We could put it to the ventilator. The size is based on the internal diameter. Those tubes I showed you, like a 7.5, that's the internal diameter of the tube is what we're looking at. Obviously, length increases with increased diameters because... Obviously, we're dealing with a bigger patient, bigger airway. And we talked about a little bit about cuffed and uncuffed. I usually, I, years ago, it used to be just, you know, uncuffed were only for kids, and now they're going back to cuffed with kids, okay? But, like, so the whole point of the balloon in there, again, it just kind of secures it. It doesn't mean it's a perfect seal. It just helps secure it in there, okay? Actually, the more of the idea is we're trying to prevent air from escaping in and out around it. It's not really supposed to be, like, electrical liquid seal, so just keep that in mind. <laughs> Again, the advantages, um, it secures the airway. We can drop some medications down there. Uh, you know, the lane means um, lidocaine, at, uh, atropine, uh, Narcan, and Epi. That's all it means. So just those, that's about pretty much it, too. The only drugs you can drop down. Anything else you drop down will probably be, you know, you know give them aspiration pneumonia or it could be necrotic to lung tissue. I knew somebody who actually dropped, you know, an amp of bicarb down the tube. So, nice thing about it, again, um, maximum oxygenation ventilation because we've got a secure airway. We don't have to worry about, you know, things getting in the way like the tongue or, you know, any kind of any uh, tissue or whatever the case may be. Suctioning, nice uh, thing about that is that we got nice little catheters. I'll go down the tube and we can suction on the way out. So, it gives us a little bit more direct uh, approach there into the actual lung field itself. thing with also suctioning, we don't understand what we'll talk about measuring suctioning. It's uh, actually measured from, you know, to what they call the angle of uh, Louis or the notch here. We don't want this, we never want anything to wander past outside the tip of the tube because we start going back there, we could be doing damage and anything that migrates can do damage. So, in fact, the only thing you'll ever see that's ever really condoned where you could, it goes past the tube is a, uh, is a bougie. That's what they call a bougie. And basically it's just, nice piece of, it's thin, it's bendable, it's flexible, it's for those tough airways. Once you get in, you can just slide that tube over it and then pull out the bougie. But it's, like I said, it's geared to just be relatively soft and not damage anything. Disadvantage with uh, endotracheal intubation requires special equipment and it bypasses the upper airway. 
It's kind of yes or no, if you want to look at it. Just remember, when you bypass that upper airway, you take away things that could humidify air, filter air, and so forth. And like, so a lot of times they try to avoid innovation as much as possible because you're more susceptible to infection at that point. Indications, okay. Present or impending respiratory failure. Remember I was telling you that little curve? Never really, I never really explained how that kind of curve, did I? Too much? Your little, your little bell curve or whatever? Yeah, my little curve. So, let's say... This is kind of like, this is how one of the ways I used to would look at people just right off the bat kind of walking into somebody, especially if they're having problems breathing. If I come in, I look at Brandy, she's looking at me, she's cracking me, she's obviously she's not having any distress because she's not even breathing through her mouth right now. So something like that, she says, yeah, I'm having some problems, my stomach hurts, just send the other, okay, I'm more, you know, I can put a cannula on that. I go over to Clint, he drops his jaw on me, you know, he's kind of leaning back in the chair, but he's still tracking me. You still got, I still see some, you know, relatively, you know, within uh, decent movement of his chest. I'll probably put him on a non-breather. Ethan, on the other hand, you know, he hit the heroin from Russ. You know, he's just kind of zoning out on me. Maybe I'll just, you know, BVM in until he gets some Narcan. But, you know, he's not really down. He's not really bad yet. You know, we, you know, he's still trying to maintain his, his airway a little bit. You know, or maybe he just eventually drops. Hey, then we can put the tube at him at that point. Some of these people you're going to run into, in fact, what gets even more creative is when you guys go along the road here, we'll start throwing in things like, you know, where, where does CPAP fill, fit in into this game? Or, because sometimes I kind of look at CPAP kind of fitting in like about right there-ish, you know. You know, when you decide to do, you know, put a, a, an ETT uh, versus a king or some other kind of rescue area, where's that balance? But it's just kind of one of those things of kind of gauge even when you, if you start, when you start looking at patients and interacting with them, say, where are they right now and where could they be? Because you might be putting somebody on an honor breather right now, but you're thinking, it's like, how much is this guy going to last before they quit? Or I'm going to have to start jumping in here, you know? I mean, asthmatics can be very tricky with this because you can sit there and you're like, okay, run this asthmatic. They're kind of sitting about here. You got your neb going. We're giving albuterol. The question is, where are they going to go? Do they get they get better? We kind of slide down here. If they keep getting worse, I got to worry about this issue. If it's a real bad asthmatic, I'm going down this path already. So start. Some of the things to kind of look at when you start looking at uh, patients and say, well, what does this person need right now? You know, how sick are they? Where are they going to go? Now just kind of just practice gauging that, or even when you talk to the physicians and stuff. But but again, like I said, for an ET tube, like so, we're looking at, and we're looking somebody sliding down this curve. They're sliding down this curve, or they're about to slide, or they're teeter-tottering up here and say, "Okay, this is going to happen. It's just a matter of when, and how do we want this to play out?" The obvious one is they're not breathing. They're not breathing. We breathe for them. The other uh, thing we got to look at here, well, protecting their own airway. You know, what if they got their face stomped by a, you know, a bull, you know, at some rodeo? You know, they're trying to gasp, breathe, or, you know, the guy who tries to shoot him, um, his face off with a shotgun. You know, fa one of those failed suicide kind of things. You see bubbling coming out, it's kind of like, well, he can't obviously protect it. So, you know, he can't protect himself, so we got to protect it for him. Obviously, at that point, we're actually dropping a little bit more drugs and whatnot to kind of help facilitate that. So just remember that when we start going using uh, ET, you know, we're pretty much saying there, there's no hope here. There's no hope. So this is kind of, again, problems that we've kind of ran into years for a lot of the years. A lot of people intubate because they can, because they're unresponsive, you know, or I can't show up to the hospital without it. A lot, like I said, it's a lot of time now. It's, if you don't, you can get the, the results you want with, you know, out of an ET tube and you can do it with a King or BVM, that's fine. It's just right tool, right job. That's all you need to kind of look at when you start approaching early management. Remember, in fact, you want to hear another real creepy story? 
Denver General years ago. I, I don't know if they're still doing it. I've lost touch with a lot of those guys up there. But I know some of the guys that, that taught me used to work up there. And they used to talk about how they'd get the homeless, hold them up in the, the captain's chair. They'd practice nasally intubating them. And then they'd come walking in to the ER with their tube out, and walking in with their own IV bag. You know, different world, man. Different world. So, problem with an ET tube, obviously, keep in mind it's <coughs> we're going into the, the soft tissue of the mouth, you know, and we're not just dealing with the lips and tongue. We're going further back, and like I said, we're going, you know, around the tongue and all that tissue down in there, too. The big thing when we talk about ET tubes, when I'll get a, a laryngoscope blade and some equipment here, and we'll kind of show you, it's just there's the problem with when we insert, we're always going to this. This is the natural motion that we do. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what breaks teeth. You know, you're actually doing this. You're going up and away. So, laryngeal edema, interlingual spasm, just remember, you keep poking around in there, especially if there's any kind of injury or any kind of, you know, angioedema. Possibility to make it worse. And like I said, in the lingual spasm, like say so you, you shut it on you, there's not a whole lot you can do. Vocal cord injury, there have been cases where people uh, were getting over aggressive with putting that tube in, and next thing you know, they barely talk, or they talk in a very high, high pitched voice. The issue here with hypoxia is there, people are basically playing too much with that tube, trying to get that tube in, then making sure that patient gets oxygenated. You know, and I mean, God, I could think of many times like, no, 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 let me try, let me try. And we're like forgetting to ventilate the patient and all this business. And like, finally, somebody gets it. Yeah, I got it. You know, and you know, about, you know, what, already five minutes, you know, four or five minutes have gone by and you're, you know, we're, you know, screwing off. Aspiration, like I said, if their gag, it, gag reflex is not completely uh, gone at that point, you start, you know, fiddling with that, you can make them cough and, you know, obviously, and you can inhale. The also thing is, is that you put that blade in there, like I said, you lift that esophagus up too, and if anything's in that stomach, and it can roll out, it's gonna roll out, and like I said, you now got exposure up into the uh, trachea itself. Esophageal intubation, very common. It's very common, it takes a little while to kind of sit there and be able to identify which is which, because especially if it, when you put your blade in there, it's dark, it's creepy, you lift up, okay, wait a minute, I see you know, portal of entry, it's not it. And like I said, you can always tell, you know, off stop, I guess, because once you put the tube in, let's open the belly first, you'll hear the bubbling and you'll feel their belly rise. You're like, yeah, I got that one. So remove, put the tube where it's supposed to be. Uh, main stem bronchus. Uh, a lot of times people go a little bit too far, too fast. That's the problem. You know, we only go, when you put in that tube, you only go past that cuff. That's all you need to do. Pass that, once you set cuff, go past the vocal cords, you're good. It's just that people get, you know, like I said, you'll see this a lot. People will get there and they'll get, you'll just, they'll just want to move so fast and so quickly to get this done that you'll sit there and see hands changing, doing this, and they're not even really watching what they're doing. So, talk about the different techniques here. Oral tracheal innovation, um, obviously, is pretty much a lot what you will see, pretty much mainly be trained to do. Uh, nasal innovation, it's, it's kind of faded out ever since they, we have allowed uh, RSI into the field and rapid sequence innovation, paralytics and all that. If you guys want to learn nasal innovation, I will show you how to do that. Is it's, it on the National Registry? No. But it's, it's a very... Nasal innovation is actually probably the, more, is probably the most difficult out of all these. Because like I said, you're going through their nose. You, they have to be breathing. And it's a lot of feel, It's a lot of finesse. You have to feel your way through it. And then once you get the vocal cords, you want you actually trying to stimulate them to cough. Then when they inhale, you want that's when the tube goes. In fact, most of the time they would suck the tube down. So anyway, digital intubation. Talk about that retrograde and <coughs> translumination. Okay, big thing uh, you need to do here. I'm like I said, ninety percent of this is going to be preparation. So if I'm going to sit there and <coughs> we're going to intubate Ethan, you know, Doug, with the BBM, start ventilating him. Put an OPA in. Do what you got to do at this point. Position his head. I'm gonna make sure I got all my toys in line, everything's in order, because I don't want to do too much crossing hands or trying to figure out looking for this. I want everything to go one step, next step, next step. Because like I said, that procedure itself, that getting in here and doing that, that's 10%. That's it, that's 10% of this whole procedure. So getting everything pre ready, prepped, and ready to go, I want that nice and neat as much as possibly as I can. 
So position and ventilate the patient, obviously EKG. Obviously if you start getting a little hypoxic, you'll get a little tachycardic, and then after that you start getting real bradycardic. So just kind of keep in mind on that. Pulse, pulse oximeter, uh, again, uh, put it on there, keep an eye on it. We're not, we obviously can't do entitled CO2 because we're trying to induce the tube that will give us what we need. The other thing here is assess patient's uh, airway for difficulty. A lot of, this is a big step a lot of paramedics forget. They sit there and say, okay, I'm too busy getting this tube, I'm you know, pulling all this junk out, it's all flying all over the place, and they're not sitting there think, well, you know what, I'm not even trying to assess this. Not even trying to figure out what's going on. The uh, assemble suction equipment, like I said, you open this up, it's in the gastric, you Sorry. know. Yeah. All kinds of goo can come out. Hyperventilate, uh, there's a, depending on who you read and what year it is, sometimes they'll say hyperventilate, though, sometimes they'll say oxygenate, sometimes they'll say pre-oxygenate. This is one of those what, you know, kind of what National Registry kind of puts in their sheet. I, th sheet. I think right now it says oxygenate the patient. Basically, the idea is we're trying to build up a little bit of reserve in, uh, for their oxygen in their body, so that way when we put the tube, it won't have to worry about it. Realistically, if we've got a good, you know, ventilations going, and, you know, you know Doug's doing his business, and sometimes it, the... Uh, People in the OR will do this, and I remember when they uh, did this to me. They said, okay, ventilate, ventilate, okay, now stop. And we just sit there and watched and watched, and of course you're like, well, wait, I'm supposed to do something, I'm supposed to do something. About a minute goes by, sats are still good. You all right? I'm like, like, just relax. We got time, we got time. <laughs> it's like, got to get that kind of you know perception there of like, yeah, I actually do have a little bit of time. Just relax, relax. So, so are you saying that... It not think of it more of kind of going on the high end, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to, you know, kind of instead of like what normal respirations we're looking at, like, you know, 10 to 30, we're on that kind of that right at that 30 ish, you know, before we go down to like that, you know, 14, 16 area. We're just going on that little high end. We don't want to go past because then at that point, we're, like I said, we're put, we're trying to just, we're just shoving air in and, yeah nothing's coming out. Or, you know, if we're ventilating too fast and we're just moving air up and down the, you know, dead space and not accomplishing anything. So, position patient, open mouth. Um, Clint, on the table there. Yep. Yep. So basically what we're gonna do, Clint's here. I'm getting here, I'm gonna get his head up because I wanna make this as easy as possible for me. When I open this up, and I'm not gonna stick my hands in your mouth, don't worry. But I'm gonna come from right to left. The, the laryngoscope is a left-handed tool. There's no way around that. And so you're gonna have to get used to that and you're gonna have to do this right-handed for you guys who are left-handed or whatever the case may be. That's just the way it is. But anyway, I'm gonna try and take his big tongue and push it up away to the side and I wanna be able to see straight down in there. Eh, you might be too bad. Huh? Let's do it. Well, yeah, he's been in the military. He's already had all the other procedures done on him. What's the one more, right? So, we're gonna identify landmarks. Uh, talk about a little bit of that advanced laryngoscope blade. Again, depending on what we use, Valekiel or uh, the Miller or the Mac, depending on what it is. I understand why it's got Miller and Miller, but this is supposed to be Mac and then Miller. So just understand. Maybe somebody was thinking about beer or something. So. Burp is what they call backwards upright pressure. All we're doing is pushing this, because you know we're talking about how airways can be anterior. We're actually gonna push down, and then we're gonna push this back and up to the right. So we're actually, we wanna put this in our angle of sight is all we're doing. And kind of the thing to do, especially if you got more help, you know, like, you know, if I sit there, come here, Doug. I sit there, I'm gonna try and uh, intubate Brandy. I'm gonna sit there and say, come here, give me your hand. Maybe kind of go to the side. Now I'm gonna sit there and say, okay, I'm gonna do this, I got my blade, I'm gonna push down to where I want it, say hold it right there. So now he's holding it, now I'm free to do something else. Make sense? So it's those little things that kind of get you out of the way or that way you can play with it and say, now just hold this position. And you'll be able to see, you'll be able to manipulate the uh, trachea enough to see what you're doing. So just remember that little acronym, backwards upright pressure. <laughs> so anyway, again, we're gonna elevate the uh, epiglottis. Uh, directly, uh, again, straight curved, case may be. Visualize the good vocal cords. We know what vocal cords look like, right? You know, they're nice and white, they're nice and healthy. If they're nice gray, we know they smoke a lot, right? 
So end of the tube from the corner of the mouth, secure tube. Big thing is once you get that tube in there, somebody's gotta be holding that tube, no matter what. I don't care if it's inflated, I don't care if you duct tape that thing down, somebody holds that tube, okay? And we'll talk about kind of managing that, you know, when whoever is holding that tube, but we don't want, we don't want that to slip. So then in that case, just re reassess a tube placement, ventilation effectiveness, and so forth. Okay, the big thing is, once you get through the vocal cords, like I said, we're only going about a half inch past the cords. Guess what, that nice cuff is about a half inch. So you're just gonna go past those cords, you're done, that's it. <clears throat> continue to hold on to the tube, continue to hold on to the tube, continue, if I see you, and we're doing scenarios, I see you practicing, I see you not hold the tube, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pull the tube and say you lost it. Even after we put the black block in the letter? You hold that damn tube. There's, there's no sacred ground. I mean, like I said, never let have somebody, somebody's holding hold. Always hold. Can it be the person who's bagging? That's fine. But somebody's holding that tube. It's just, like I said, like the reality is, they're counting on us to, to lose that tube. And because of our environment, that can happen too. So the thing is, if somebody's holding that tube and paying attention to what they're doing, we know some, we're okay. That slips and they're going to feel it. Problem is, even with those little bite blocks you're talking about, and we'll show in a minute, they basically will block them down and have a little way to crank it in. You could be bagging, bagging, and you'll see people do this. They'll want to see what you're doing. They're leaning forward before that tube is going. It's still staying where it is, but it's slowly, you know, working its way down. So that's why we hold, you know, we want to hold that and make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And like I said, be careful on who you have ventilating for you, because obviously you're not going to be able to sit ventilating all the time. Make sure you have somebody ventilating. I remember they were doing some training back there one day. And the guy's okay, guy comes in, gets a tube, this, that, and the other, guy's holding the tube. He starts doing this. Well, the tube starts bending over. He said, and it's like, come on, he's sitting straight up here, you know, doing this. It got to the point, I was like, okay, you go over here, you come here and ventilate. Because he, was, he just wanted to see what everybody else was doing. So you got to keep eye on those things, okay? No matter what, especially with these procedures, once they're done, you're still responsible for them, no matter who is ventilating or doing anything like that. You're still responsible. So anyway, ventilate, uh, confirm placement. Again, we're going to listen to our belly. We're going to listen to second intercostal space, ventricular, fifth intercostal space, mid axillary. We're going to okay, we got good. We're going to inflate the cuff. Now we're going to have to worry about any air leaks. We can get maximum air in and, and CO2 out, right? And we got more videos. When you're auscultating like the epigastric sounds, you're doing on the upper left quadrant. I mean, yeah, where the stomach is. Let's go right. Let's go right on top of it. Trust me, you'll feel it. I mean, it sounds like noticeable. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. And just you know, when you you'll do here, you'll just sound like blowing bubbles in water. And you put it on there, you ventilate, you'll feel it inflate. Does, it, does the dummy do that? No. Yeah. So you'll tell us. Oh, you're not in the bubble. bubble. You'll tell because when, with the sim man, when you ventilate, if you're in the uh, lungs, you'll see the chest wrong. rise. If you're not. You won't see anything rise. <clears throat> I'm going to say what happened here. I guess they're taking my links away. It worked the other day. Huh? That oh, one? Never mind. I thought you were. The one, the one on here did. Oh, probably. I'll try it again in a minute. I just copied and pasted to the, the URL. If he did, come on. Put up new link. Did these work for you? It's like the video itself, not the link. Seems to be. I watched the lady, the same video that lady that did it in YouTube. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
It was a bad connection. Oh, Jesus. Oh. 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 Well, let me, before we go to this, uh, let me just, let's show you how to, you're supposed to be doing before we get into that one. <laughs> just a suggestion. We can talk about difficult airways in here in a minute. Just imagine if you learned all that guy. What was he supposed to do? All the two. All the two. Well, did he verify it? No. No, no he just went and played it and went. Well, he just did it and went. Good boss. Full record. I was like, slowly insert it. He did that. 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 He Procedure by Kirk Shelley, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at Yale University School of Medicine. Please also see the helmet cam view of this clip. He begins by pre oxygenating the patient in preparation for the intubation. At this point, the anesthesiologist has exposed the vocal cords with the laryngoscope and he passes the endotracheal tube down the center of the vocal cords into the bronchus. It is placed in the main stem bronchus and the balloon inflated to prevent it from slipping out. The stylet that aids insertion is removed. Next, he will take the ventilation hose and attach it. So it's a surgical cam to get some better view here. This clip will be a surgeon's helmet cam view of an intubation. Performing the procedure is Kirk Shelley, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology at Yale University School of Medicine. Nice 
super acid. So is that somebody just like volunteering to get animated or something? Probably have some or a release or something. Can we film this? We're giving you some medication for that. I think this is sweet. Propofol. You don't hear anything? You don't hear anything? Hey, what? Take a break. These are not the best. Let's see if I can find some actual good ones that uh, show you what to do here. So anyway, uh, time allowed, 30 seconds. You know, or they say hold your breath. After 30 seconds, withdraw, oxygenate, approach again. You know, they say you only have two attempts. After two attempts, then we kind of move on to other things or other airway measures. Uh, death occurs from failure to ventilate, not failure to innovate. Again, we get preoccupied with trying to get that tube in with, you know, OCD kicks in, and that's all we're thinking about is getting that tube, getting that tube, getting that tube, and that's it. And guess what happens? I was telling you earlier, with the, you know, what happens if we're all trying to get the tube, and what's the patient doing? <laughs> doing that business. Uh, the equipment here, just kind of give the quick equipment list here, obviously. Microscope blades, handles, stylets. The stylets is pretty much just a, you know, piece of wire that kind of holds the shape of the tube. I'll pull some stuff here in a minute. I'm talking about uh, a syringe, a McGill's lubricant. Uh, BAM, it's just this little orange cap thing you put on top of the tube, and when air comes out, it gives a whistling noise. That's all that does. Do you only use that for nasals? Yeah, we, uh, to do a nasal tube, you have to make sure they're breathing. So a big thing here is to get familiar with the uh, sizes between males and females and, and the depth. So the, the MAC, they, they go in a smaller number? That's, is that my reading? <laughs> oh, they go all the way down to like zero. No, but I mean like, you see the... Definitely. I'm sorry. They go up to MAC 4. <laughs> MAC 4 looks like a shoehorn. Anyway, things to point out, the uh, vocal cord marker and Murphy's Eye, when we put a stylet in, that guide wire, it's not going to go past that. Okay, that stylet, uh, stylet, it's just, what? that stylet, that's Murphy's Eye, oh. what they call Murphy's Eye. The reason that they have that is because they think this part could get occluded, so that part's open. So it's kind of like this little, you know, fail safe there for whatever reason. But yeah, whenever we put a stylet, and I'll show you what a stylet here, but we just, it holds form, but we don't want anything ever going past that, even when we do um, endotracheal suctioning. Nothing go, we don't want anything going past that. We want to be able to just take what's down there and bring it up, but we, but we don't want to go in and playing in the actual lung tissue itself. 
Again, here's our pediatric tubes like I kind of showed you uh, earlier. Again, these are the uncuffed ones. We don't have any cuffed uh, pediatric tubes right now, so I'd show you. But the same concept, like I said, you see the nice big thick lines? Don't go past them. There, up there. So with the pediatrics, generally we want to stick with uncuffed, you know, for now. And the Miller is preferred. The reason is, is that Miller gives, uh, pulls up, holds up the epiglottis when it's bigger. And two, when you put in the uh, Mac blade, <clears throat> you go into the molecular. And the problem is, is that you can, when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you guys familiar what happens? Heart, high, heart rate goes down, um, blood pressure goes down. And that's the thing you got to kind of worry about with kids because, like I said, kids are very airway, one, they're very airway dependent, and two, they, you know, when it comes to cardiac output, they don't have a stroke volume like we do. They just have heart rate. That's all they're really counting on. So you don't want to take that away from them. Generally, like I said, a preemies, uh, you know, 2 to 2.5, newborns, 3 to 3.5. Big thing to remember here is the equation, age divided by 4 plus 4. And if you ever want to figure out the uh, length of a tube, generally it's just the, uh, the diameter of the tube times three. With the equation, like if it, like my daughter's three, so it should be like a 4.75, do you go to a five? Or do you go up or down as far as like tube size? I think it's smaller. Yeah. So H is three? Yeah. So you'd be four or five? Yeah, I'd probably go like a four or five. Just whatever's closest, or a five, it just depends. Depends how mature she looks. So generally, a lot of times they'll prefer that you just uh, ventilate before you intubate a child. I mean, they kind of look at it, especially with children, they really want to keep that as a last ditch effort with them. Is that secondary because of the, them, they, uh, they pull themselves out? I think a lot of it is because they get dependent on the tube. Okay. And, the, and the thing is, they're also more prone to infection than we are. And like I said, you bypass all this that air come in, I mean anything can walk in there. And you'll actually you'll see this with elderly too, they can get very, very uh, dependent on that tube and it takes a little bit to wean, it takes quite a bit to wean them off. Especially if they got, you know, chronic lung disease or something like that. You know, you're breathing for them, they don't have to struggle. Why would they give it up? So, the big thing here, uh, and this actually goes with adults too, the, the, they refer to this as align the three axes, okay? And we want to get that, it, basically everything, into a, a straight line. You know, we have oral, our pharynx, our tracheal, and we want to try and get as straight line as possible. This thing you can actually also do with this, you know, they put the towel under the kid's head. You actually can put the towel under her shoulders, and that can actually help you out even better. So, Just so instead of under the head? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, he's up the show because yeah, remember the kids are going to have. What, okay, magic question: What's the difference between child's anatomy versus an adult's? What else? Bigger the tongue. Head is larger. Their bodies are bigger. Tongue is larger. Tongue is larger. Head is larger. Tongue is larger. Trachea is smaller. Smaller. Where's it smallest at? Okay. And what's what about their trachea? What's it what's it shaped? Funnel. Right. So. So yeah, putting actually lifting your shoulders up and keeping that head up, you can actually get that axis a lot better. The same thing with an adult. It's actually, a nice thing about adults, by the way, when you're intubating adults, um, actually intubating anybody really, a lot a lot of people get kind of cautious with it. <coughs> I remember one time watching an anesthesiologist, he literally just picked this guy's head up right up the floor, let the head hang down. That was it, and then lowered it back down. You're good. So and that was as you made it. It showed me just how simple it was. So I was like, you know, well, if he can do it. You picked up the whole head by the jaw? Yeah, yeah. by the blade. Just lift it up. Everything fell right in the line. Put it back down. You know, it's, it's, it's the tissue. I mean, you're not damaging anything. You're just holding everything up. So the real trick is, the real trick is, and, and some people, Sorry, but some guy walking around with his little jacket and hood zipped up, he asked me a little, you know, something about hearing about, you know, school in Virginia is kind of, so. Well, the door's locked, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, you can't actually intubate somebody who's spinal immobilized with collar and everything intact. People will disagree with me, but I can actually show you how it's done. 
It's it can be done. Huh? I'll show uh, if we have time. Um, if we have time Saturday, I'll show you how it's done. It's it's there, there's a little trick to it. Oh, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Three seconds before the campus police call on you. Are you serious? Hell yeah. Come in here. <laughs> 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 All I see you just you know walking and creeping by. I'm like, I don't know, you know, I think it's only a new Virginia thing going on here. Like, is the door locked? Not anymore. Score. You out of here? No. No. I was just uh, screwing right. with you. I knew it would work. Good. Yeah, good job. <laughs> They hire anybody around here. Hey, I'm here. <laughs> the airway assessment, uh, cervical spine, obviously we've got to be careful of that. You know, especially cervical spine injury. Uh, temporal mandibular joint. Pretty self-explanatory. Obviously we need to be able to have some maneuverability to uh, put the blade in there. What's the AO joint? Axial occipital. Yeah. So anything we're gonna look at here is neck uh, length, size, muscularity, uh, mandible size, and relation overbite, and tongue size. This is the other part of the thing that a lot of people will bypass because they're, you know, caught up in the moment. They want to get this too, but they don't really assess what airway you're kind of dealing with. One thing you're gonna kind of find out here is. There's actually quite a bit you can find out before you even actually do this whole procedure, but you've got to make sure you have everything done. Like I said, make sure your equipment's right, make sure everything's go, make sure you assess that airway, and at least because then at least the, the only thing that's unknown is when you lift up and see down. And that way, like so that's that's the only and that's the only variable at that point. Don't create more variables for you to overcome in the meeting process. Uh, Ackerman, uh, they like to use your mouth, you know, mandible opening, uvula teeth, head stylet. Is this just something to look at? Or silhouette. For before, like, hey, how are you doing? And then look at them to see what okay. I don't. But I mean, is that the whole thing? That's, that's it, the idea is. Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, if you're looking at somebody who I'm going to intubate, I mean, well, actually, the next one up here is uh, this 332 rule is actually one of the better ones. But obviously, look externally. My biggest thing, obviously, there's no damage, no trauma, no deformities. You know, I'm not wearing any, you know, tumors or anything of that nature. Uh, the 322, uh, we'll talk about in a minute. Mountain patty, uh, obstructions, and neck mobility kind of getting here. Again, big thing here, look, morbidly obese. If they're morbidly obese, they're going to have extra tissue on the inside. That's the big thing you got to worry about. The facial hair might just be able to get in the way, but... Generally not. It's just you know securing the tube is going to be a little bit of a pain, depending on what kind of equipment you have. Narrow face, the narrow the face, less workspace you got. That's all it means. So just remember that less workspace. Uh, overbite usually, it's, and it's not really the overbite is the issue. It's the actual sunk jaw going back. Right because then that's again that's less maneuverability to manipulate that jaw. That overbite is not too much. It's that jaw moving back. You know, less play and again less workspace. And obviously trauma, if it's all broken and busted, what can you do? Okay, three, two, two. Again, here's the thing, we're getting ready to ventilate. You know, I'm getting ready to ventilate Ethan again. I'm gonna open his mouth up. I'm gonna say, oh, I'm not gonna put my fingers there, but that's ideally what you wanna do. Or at least his fingers should there, should be fit between his uh, teeth. Can you take their hand and do it? <laughs> yeah, on, you know, honestly. I mean, we'll have you hold it. You know, Ethan, you can do anything once. <laughs> Actually, the best best way it worked for me is um, to get around that is an OPA. You get an OPA in there, and I can kind of just well, how big is my space? Because I can I can just maneuver the tongue and jaw a little bit. Use it for tongue depression. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the big thing right there. Like I said, that's again we see what our workspace is and how move you know what movement we got. This is kind of a random <coughs> slide that got thrown in, and I want to see what this. I'm curious what this slide uh, link is.
this will work. Or maybe not. I guess nothing wants to work today on YouTube. So anyway, um, again, we'll kind of get, come back to this here, actually a little bit later. So anyway, uh, three fingers between uh, momentum and IOE. This right here, again, if you've got that sunken jaw, I've got less, you know, less workspace. So that's another thing you kind of look at right there. So just remember this here. Okay, how much fingers, less workspace. Huh? Less fingers, less workspace. Okay. That's the whole point is you're really looking for how much workspace you have. If you have less workspace, okay, it's like, well, how am I going to troubleshoot through this? So, and again, like I said, you might, uh, less than three fingers you might proportionally. Is that the YouTube clip? Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> oh, hey, check. It's actually. Very tough airway, in case you can't notice. It's actually, you know. <laughs> That's creepy. That's like. That's creepy. <laughs> you just thought you were. What color are the vocal cords? White. No, really. What color are the vocal cords? Take a look, uh, look at the gray. Like I said, just remember, you know, shorter jaw, bigger tongue, less workspace, and so forth. Floor of the mouth, the hyoid, again, shorter neck. See how the workspace gets decreased when we start taking stuff away? That's all that's saying. And the thing is, especially when you get shorter, the airway is going to be more anterior. That's when you have to really use burp and start doing your different tricks to kind of get, you know, ready for this. Because you're going to have more tongue that's going to be coming back less jaw with movement, and this is going to be up forward. Make sense? So evaluates uh, Malin Patty here. Malin Patty is actually a really, really good thing. In fact, we'll, we'll take a look at each other's Malin Patty here in a minute. But Malin Patty here is basically, we sit and open your mouth as wide as possible, and this is actually kind of good when you've got that OPA and the unconscious patient. We can kind of see what kind of airway we're dealing with. But yeah, we're just going to open up, and we're going to kind of sit there and see what can we see. Uh, not useful emergency situations, not always. Like I said, if you've got, depending, I mean, if obviously it's blood and vomit, nothing you can really do. But like I said, if you've got that moment, you can put that OPA and take a look. Take a look. So, or if you know somebody's, you know, you know, about to go into respiratory arrest, you know, chances are they're going to be, <laughs> take a quick look. So, that's all balance patty is. See the difference in a workspace? Mm -hmm. yeah. The ones and twos are very easy to do. The threes getting tougher. In fact, sometimes they say the threes and fours don't even bother trying to debate them. You know, use something like a combi tube or get ready for plan B. Use a bougie. So if you guys want to take a look at each other's Malin Patty here for a minute. So I'm really curious about yours. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> here's a nice good four right here. <laughs> take a look. Take a look at each other. Guys. Oh, God. <laughs> no, flat your tongue out, man. I don't like it. Oh. <laughs> That's crazy. Look around. Flatten your tongue, relax. Yeah, you're behind it. Oh, I could throw that thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
yeah, that's that's all we're saying. Is again looking at more workspace, more workspace, and we know we're going to be able to get down. Like I said, LPAs are good for you, you know, especially for you know we're you know, again, like I said, we're pacing ourselves out right, and we've got everybody suctioning, doing business. You know, take an LPA, take a look, see what you got going on. So, like I said, if we do all this stuff before we even intubate, we already kind of know what we're kind of dealing with. So the only thing we have to really worry about is when we actually put that blade and take a look up to what it is we can't see. So again, there's our last variable that we have to deal like with. Maybe a tumor or something like that. that yeah, like I said, the other video. <laughs> we, we, I ran into some video of some of the little, <coughs> little granuloma on, the, on their... It was disgusting. So anyway, and again, like I said, once we get in there, you know, we got to worry about is it foreign bodies, you know, tumors, abscess, don't no, pop an abscess. With problems with epiglottitis, you know, uh, hematomas, trauma, so forth. You know, again, something is going to cause our workspace to get more smaller and more difficult. So again, neck mo uh, mobility, that uh, axial occipital uh, joint there. Like I said, if we can straighten up the axes, even better. Guess what happens if you have a short neck? <laughs> you know, how much how much movement are we getting here? So. Sometimes they'll say, you know, quick test, you know, hand upwards. A lot of times you're just kind of like maneuvering with your head saying, well, how much movement I have. Usually if they have like, you know, it comes down to it's like if they have low movement in their neck, short neck, they usually have a short jaw, they usually have an overbite. And it's usually just kind of like one after the next, after the next, you'll find, uh, find out as it goes here. Anyway, when we go into the curve blade, like I said, we're going to insert from, you know, right to left. And like I said, we're going to go sweep up and away. Like I said, it's going to fit in the molecular and they call it just, you know, again, the list lifts it indirectly, because like I said, it's just kind of taking this and you'll see the epiglottis kind of flop under it. Versus the Miller, we're going to actually kind of go over and actually hold up the epiglottis when we go down. Again, the big thing you got to worry about is prying on teeth. Like I said, this is what makes you pry on teeth. Okay, this is normal. You have to fight instinct on this. You want to go like that. Actually, it's kind of almost up in a 45. So this is the last piece. When you actually open up, now we got to figure out what our grade is. Okay, more workspace, less. Who the hell knows what to deal with there? Okay, that's that's really this is the last of the pieces. So understand, you can get so much figured out before you come to this point. And if you figure to figure out, oh wait a minute, you know, you know, fat neck, obese, you know, sunken jaw, what do you think's probably we're probably going to run into eventually when we get down here? So, like I said, all that stuff can be figured out before you even have to stick a blade in. And sometimes you just, like I said, when you're, you know, out about and looking at people, start sizing them up. Say, look at their jaws, look at their motil mobility. You know, just kind of getting that in mind. In fact, you guys out in the field do the same thing. You know, or you guys out there say, you know, I'm running into your family or something, say, go, I'll run you real quick. <laughs> so we got in there. <laughs> Again, two placement. Again, it's only going to go, you know, half inch, you know, just right past the cuff. And uh, then we're, like I said, that's just, you know, we're going to check the belly, check the lungs. If it's good, we're going to inflate. Then we're going to secure. And we're going to place. Okay. Okay, ET tubes in the esophagus happens. Okay, it's just you got to be able to pick, on it, pick up on it really quick. All right, once it's one thing, you do this, you know, quite a few times, you'll be able to identify the landmarks, and you'll be able to see an esophagus versus a, uh, versus a, uh, versus vocal cords. I can tell you, I'll, I'll actually, when I get, when we get over Saturday, I'll show you a lot of the common mistakes people make, you know, and how they just trip over themselves, because I'll tell you one thing I'll notice with procedures, once somebody trips over their, on a one step, they'll go try and jump another step, but until they fix that last step, they're tripping, tripping, and then they'll come back and they'll trip and trip instead of just like fixing that initial step. So it's just everything step by step by step by step. So anyway, traditional methods here is basically we observe the ET going through the vocal cords. Again, that's something you really need to be able to document. Uh, absence of epigastric sounds, uh, presence of breast sounds, sym symmetric rise and fall, condensation of tube, and obviously we're not going to do anything with uh, chest x-rays about that in the field. But all these have failed in the clinical setting. That's the kind of the ironic thing about it. I mean, what do you think? Why? It's that curiosity. How could all? How could these fail you? Well, yeah. Yeah. Obviously. 
Yeah. Maybe. There's sounds in it. Yeah. So that would be better to be without a presence of breath sound. And then you could get it in the right main <coughs> stem and only one will rise and not the other. Like really obese, the chest rise may be hard to see. Right. Condensation of the two? They just ate some hot soup. And yeah. Plus, you know, if you, you get that belly a little bit full of air, I mean, that could actually look like chest right. rise and fall. That throws you off too. Sorry. Other things we use, <laughs> um, pulse ox, aspiration techniques. Big thing here is the big one is end tidal CO2. Is the big one that's pretty much been, that was actually, end tidal CO2 came to the field. It was actually a big push from anesthesiologists because they've been doing it for years and years and years. And they never really did much studying behind it. And then finally like, hey look, we found all these patterns and all this other stuff. And when it came to ET tubes, we found this much was secure and da 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 da. And it just blew the rest of what we were doing away. So anyway, we're going to talk about fail-safe, near-fail-safe, and the non-fail-safe. So fail-safe, uh, improvement in clinical settings. Again, we're going to go through the cords. If we have fiber optic, um, actually some fiber optic section actually glow over here. You can see a glow going through. The other thing actually do is you need to, if you're uh, putting in an ET tube and somebody's holding cricoid pressure right there, they'll feel, feel it. it. They'll feel it. Move, they'll feel the movement there. So... And of course, if you want to be able to see visual light, you can see all the way down to the carina. This is litmus paper, by the way. That's all that is. Okay. So a change in pH will change in color. Well, what's the problem if I, you know, I go into respiratory rest and I just drink a lot of soda? It's going to show. You're going to keep. You're going to, you know, because you're supposed to, you know, ventilate that at least six times, and after six times, then we sit there and say, if we have color change, then we're supposed to be good. Well, if you give me the esophagus and you're waiting for something to happen, and like I said, I drink a lot of soda, you're going to get the same thing. So, like, if you, you're giving someone, like, ventilation with the DDN, and then you're going to get gastric extension, and then you go to help, go to put in a tube, all that air is already in your stomach, wouldn't it show up on What do you mean? I don't know, we're going to have better. I guess I'm saying, I'm saying if you get the, that, in that in the esophagus, you've already got, like I said, you know, like, You've already drank a bunch of soda. You already got that. That'll do the same thing. It'll okay. give you the same result. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you get the esophagus and you yeah. gave them a bunch of air. And well, the air isn't going to change anything. It's it's the CO2 from the soda. The other thing here uh, is what they call an EDD bulb. Okay, when the idea, the concept behind that. I know. Yeah, we got plenty of that stuff um, in the back. We put that tube in, and if we're in the esophagus, we'll, we'll depress that. We'll depress that. Put on the tube, and then we'll let go. And if it reinflates, we're knowing they're in trachea. If it doesn't reinflate, it's because it's in the esophagus because it just collapsed on each other. It doesn't have anything to pull up. Okay. Now let's go back to the story of I decided to drink a whole lot of soda. We can get the same thing coming back up. So a lot of those things, like I said, we're always trying to look for all these fail safes to come through, come through, and it's like we do it, we use it, we document it, but I mean, so a lot of times it's just going to come down to uh, you know what does end tidal CO2 do? Okay, the non fail says presence of breast sounds, absence of epigastric sounds, uh, absence of uh, gastric extension, chest rise and fall, uh, large spontaneous exhaled tidal volume. So, condensation, <coughs> uh, air exiting the tube with uh, chest compressions. Actually, another one I actually found out, uh, and actually the doctor pointed out to me, she, said she wanted to figure out if my tube was good. Guy, this lady was in uh, heart failure. You know, lung roll full and have a tuber and stuff. And she was like, Yeah, I got to make sure my tube is good. She's like, Yeah, hold on. She stopped it. We just watched all of the uh, fluid come back up. She's like, You're in. All the pink fluid come up. She's like, Yeah, you're in. You're good. Like, out of the actual tube? You can just watch it back up. You know, because I'm sitting you're, you're, when you're ventilating somebody with a pulmonary edema, you're trying to push fluid back in. Yeah. yeah. So once you stop, it just went right back up. She's like, Yep, you're in. Uh, BVM has appropriate compliance. What's compliance? You can get the resistance from the system. It works with you. Okay, what's elasticity? Elasticity is it Okay. Well, well, well. Well. okay. Pressure on the suprasternal notch associated with pilot and balloon pressure. I've never used that. Okay, where are we? All right. Nasal innovations, the dying art. 
the only the idea of nasal intubation was, and most doctors will get very annoyed now if you come in with somebody nasally intubated, because when you pull that tube out, lots of blood and goo and stuff, and then they orally intubate them. Just kind of let you know. But the idea was, it's we had to give an airway, and we have we can't we either they're breathing to some degree, and we we can't get through their jaw maybe, okay, or maybe we're they're going to a respiratory arrest, and we don't want them to go completely down. Maybe we can kind of stop it on the way down. Again, this is pre-RSI, pre, -RSI, pre -RSI <coughs> and all that business. So what we do is like we get these patients. They were trauma patients. They were breathing, and they're all pretty breathing. Maybe like five, you know, ten times a minute. But like I said, we don't have paralytics, so we stick, you know, obviously an ET tube down there. We're going to get their gag reflex, right? Problem, the problem there. Well, we go nasal innovation, we, we bypass all that. We bypass the gag. We get the tube in there, we get them breathing from five times a minute to ten times a minute, or twelve times a minute. The other thing is, you get a real bad uh, head injury or CDA, and what if they, you know, Christmas and their jaw blocks up? Again, we can bypass all that. So, angioedema, nuchal rigidity. Again, like I said, if uh, neck stiff, we can't get around it. And there, we've got some respiratory, uh, spontaneous respirations at that point. Again, let's go through the nose. We can get into their esophagus and hold on, you know, hold on uh, that airway to there from that point. The big thing with this, it's like I said, it's position and it's finesse. And like I said, you can do it with somebody who's already spinally immobilized, and you can do it with somebody who is not. But like I said, it's one of those it's one of those things that's listen now, I'll show you later. Unfortunately, kind of thing. It'll make more sense once you know you come to Saturday. And I'm like, yeah, this is how we're going to play with this. And like, okay, now the pieces kind of come together. Big thing, uh, same thing though, but make sure your EKG, pulse ox, all your bells and whistles are attached. Like I said, Roy's, you know, again, we're, really the thing we're looking for is changes that are, is our procedure, you know, compromising the, the stability or current stability or stasis of the patient. That's why we're always kind of watching. If we, you know, we're doing this procedure and all of a sudden they start throwing a bunch of premature contractions and stuff, I mean, that's a sign of hypoxia right there. And that's something we've got to kind of worry about. <coughs> So the problem is with uh, the contraindications with this is obviously the same thing we saw with the you know, mid-face fractures, the basal skull fractures, uh, nasal obstruction, septal deviations. And actually, septal deviations are actually very, very common. Because those of them say, oh, yeah, go from the right there, and everything's great. It's like, or sometimes you actually look, and one there is bigger than the other, but it doesn't mean there's a slant on the way back. So you got to be just kind of careful with that. The thing with uh, nasal innovations, we'll, we'll usually... Uh, Lubricate the tube, usually we'll use lidocaine jelly. You guys are familiar with that? It's really funny. We used to put that on, a, on our other co-worker steering wheels for giggles. <laughs> no, we didn't do that. That's, that's, that's dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> that's dangerous. That's dangerous. <laughs> Making their hands numb is one thing. You know, that was a brisk in itself. Bottoming out the pressure. Yeah, yeah. bottoming out the pressure. Everybody knows you get nitro, nitro to pigeons. <laughs> but... Huh? Oh, no, let's see. no, that does. No, that works too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the idea of a BAM, like I said, it's when you put the BAM on with a breathing and expiration of whistle. Plus, it's actually a little bit better uh, protection in case something else comes out, which can very easily happen. Uh, you can do this with a patient sitting upright. You can do them laying down. You can do all kinds of positions with an able tube. <coughs> you can do it, you know, behind them. You can do it standing in front of them. Anyway, you go to and uh, find the best scenario you can. Advance slowly, steadily, and again, it's a lot of feeling, a lot of feeling your way through this. You know, you go listen to the tube before we had bands. We actually had to listen to air movement, which was kind of bad because you had to always kind of keep an eye on it. Yeah, it's okay. I don't know if yeah. Or yeah, we had, we had, I had really fast reflexes at one point. <laughs> I had real, I mean, I was like, <laughs> out of the way. The other thing you really, really have to worry about this, too, and um, they'll suck the tube down. And you have a little tube, you have a little adapter with the BDM. Those things love to pop off. And I actually had this happen, and, you know, we have a little, you know, the inflation cuff, little port right there. That's the only thing I was able to grab before this guy sucked the tube down because it was like right even just flush with his nair and that top adapter had popped off on me. So you got to be really, really careful with that. Somebody, they will suck the tube down on you. Will this be something you could do like if somebody's been trapped in a vehicle, like you need to innovate them if you can't get... You're breathing. Yeah. 
That's, I mean, that was that was the perfect tool for it. Just kind of del a delay in your belt. There. Like, if they're going down, like, you can sit there and just do that. And yeah. Any device is better than that. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it was, God, I mean, we used to do this all the time. You know, and like I said, it's just not very, not very many people teach it anymore. And, you know, I mean, I think if you go further north where I'm from, that's still pretty common. You know, but like around here, you know, I actually ran into one person that was, uh, in fact, of all the places, he actually worked in Denver. We actually had this lady CDA, and it was like, <coughs> and I'm like, please screw it up, I want to take it. And he just sunk it on me. I was like, you suck. <laughs> <coughs> Anyway, securing a nail tube, the other side is a little bit more trickier. You got to make sure you really tape that thing down because it's not obviously not putting a bite block on it. But check and also always re reassess the nasal tube. Those things love to migrate. It's actually even best if you, if uh, they are unconscious or to whatever point, put them on a backboard. Actually, with any tube, actually, put them on a backboard just to stabilize their neck as much as you can. Uh, obviously, if they're relatively awake, or, you know, it's more of a kind of just more of a medical versus trauma and you have to have them set them up, that's fine too. But just do what you can. But like I said, it's, they can, those tubes can migrate. And like I said, you get an ET tube, you're actually taking from here, but now you're giving it a more roundabout way down through here. Digital intubation, sticking your fingers <coughs> down someone's throat. This is one of those, the more you practice it, the better you can get at it. I mean, it's really about it. I mean, there, I mean, I mean, I, I, I've done you know one in the field, and like I said, it just kind of creeped me out because, like I said, I just was worried about a bite reflex. But we used to just have fun in you know class all the time. We always practice you know, digital <coughs> innovations just for giggles. We got really, we were getting really good at it. I guess. But uh, ideas, like I said, you know, go in there. Your middle finger holds up epiglottis. You put it in between these two fingers, and this, your index finger, is what actually guides the tube down. Kind of guides a tube down, and you're like, oh, okay, you'll feel it go right through and under, and kind of cool. Looks cool. <coughs> yeah, I just I don't like sticking my hand <laughs> yeah, right. out. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's all it is. Yeah. But, yeah, so your index finger, like I said, is actually curving that tube up so it goes anterior where it's supposed to. Okay, surgical crikes. <coughs> A okay, big thing with a surgical crike is there better be an absolute definitive way. There's no other possible way. You've tried everything, and this is the absolute last-ditch effort in any way possible because you will stand before the man and answer questions whether it was the right decision or not. How's that for an answer? Okay. They, the state gets nervous when you do these. Physicians get nervous when you do these. Everybody gets nervous when you do these because you're cutting someone's throat. That's really about it. So make sure you understand. Most of the time, it's they corrects are very justifiable in traumatic situations, in some medical situations. It better be a damn good one, you know. Like I've got tied this, Andrew. You know, everything is shut down. You're royally screwed. There's no other way possible. After every attempt, this, that, and the other, and you've got to be able to, like I said, be able to justify that. That's. Have you ever done one in the field? Huh? Have you ever done one in the field? I can do them back here really fast, but um, everybody, it, I de actually the guy I used to work with in Colorado taught me a lot. He actually did one of these in a moving vehicle. But I mean, he was, he was good. I mean, he was one of those, like, you know, he just slammed tubes left and right. And he was, he, was, uh, he uh, trained up in, D up in Denver General. Denver General, if you're not familiar with that, is a lot of trauma. Lots and lots. I mean, Colorado people don't play nice with each other at all. Yeah, we like to stab and beat each other constantly. <laughs> well, it's, no, it really it was a big trip because, I mean, when I came down here, a lot of times we get call on side call. Nine times out of ten, we turn into a brawl. You know, I mean, you'd just be the most strangest thing. Yeah, I'm feeling suicidal. Next thing you know, you're out of the truck. Everything is okay. Next thing you know, you're like, you know, in a brawl and you're ready to tie this guy down kind of a thing. Sure. So, of course, I came down here and I'm thinking, you know, larger city, you know. No, they're just crazy people. They're just not violent, though. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, Colorado people are just a different breed. We are a different breed. So, but anyway, like I said, just understand this is the be all end all. There's no way around it. We're going to cut this guy's throat, and you will be, you know, answering questions later, regardless. You know, and it's not. And even if it was all for the right situations, understand it's just the state. Everybody just gets on edge when you do this. 
Even if you do it right? Mm -hmm. Even if you do it right. And then ask why? Yep, you want to make sure. Because it, well, one, keep in, uh, keep in mind it's the physician's license that's at risk. Two, the state, they see something like this that just puts a red flag no matter what, so they want to know about it. You know, I mean, it's just, it just makes a lot of people nervous. A lot, a lot of people nervous. I mean, they've got other toys now, like little quick trachs and stuff like that, but, you know, the way I'm going to show you back there is just the old fashioned, <coughs> we're going to come down, cut his throat, stick a tube down, and you're done. So. Do like quick tricks still raise red flags? Oh yeah. <coughs> anytime, any, anything, time you anytime you cut someone's throat, man. <laughs> well, the thing is, you got yeah. Anytime you cut someone's throat, it's they are ugh. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Why are you about to be such whiners? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll they'll come back and try and see. You like the scar here? I don't care if I'm alive. <laughs> I have the scar. I'm suing you. Craig, uh, Craig sir, for eight, or eight, for the big kids, okay? We go with little kids, we start sticking needles. They'll do needles instead. You can actually do a needle on an adult, but understand it's probably not going to do a whole lot, but it's something better than nothing. So anyway, um, evidence of fractured larynx or cricoid cartilage. Like I said, <coughs> when you get your landmarks and you know what you're doing, you hold on to <coughs> things for dear life. I mean... When I, show, when I show you in the lab, I mean, it'll be like, you one here, nothing moves. You put something in here, nothing moves. Remove, grab, nothing moves. You do not want to lose your spot. You don't want to lose that spot for anything. You know, as soon as you do it, I mean, you're gone. And like I said, you got to remember, this is going to bleed. This is a very vascular. <coughs> this thyroid here, very vascular. You know you have a little piece of thyroid tissue that goes across? You guys remember what it's called? The isthmus? That's thyroid tissue. It loves to bleed. What do we got over here? Sure. Lots of ass, yeah, jugs, internal jugs, you know, arteries. So just remember that. You start cutting someone's throat, that's all they're going to think is that what did you destroy? So the other thing is, uh, some people have actually done crikes and they have actually gone gotten so overzealous they've actually thrown it right, gone through the uh, trachea and right back into the esophagus. Because they were just like I said, it's it's a people get really nerve wracked about this because they're cutting someone's throat. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I like I said, I was kind of one of those just like I'm not trying to think once, but not my throat. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Here's the big difference. Obviously, we got this membrane. This is kind of why one we're dealing with smaller diameter and smaller uh, tissue. That's why we're going with the needle. Thyroid membrane? Yep, cricothyroid membrane. Okay. If you guys want to check each other's cricos, everybody's, especially females, it's a little bit. I don't know. It's just like a little bit of space, like a little kiss. Oh, yeah. You can hear Adam's knuckle, right? That's under it. I don't know. I'm feeling uncomfortable. Sorry. You're right there. God damn it. I wish I could sit right there. I mean, you found it. You're right here. I think I found it. I've been practicing a lot, trust me. <laughs> Wait, that's that my issue, all right? Like, grab your tongue out. It's a little bit of a spill bifurcation up here. But isn't it, isn't it an it's like a little dip kind of? Yeah, right here. It's kind of thing, it's just like right here. And then kind of just feel with one finger. Kind of get the tongue in. Here's a good one. If you want to feel a little bit, this is pretty fine. Okay, I must be retarded. Actually, really weird. <laughs> you know, a lot of people that are uh, thy uh, thyroid cartilage kind of goes up like this at the very top. Mine's actually split. Yeah. 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 The membrane is what you're you're cutting through the hypothyroid membrane. Yeah. And so what is the space between the cartilage and the 
what is at this what is the space that you're actually how big is it that you're actually cutting between, exactly between right. it's like, it's, is it like this it's right even like you're going right across it right here that way you can go through it. what's the up and down yeah up and down height. the height of it of the space of the space between. Yeah. That space between. Talking about once you once you cut from from cartilage to cartilage and then fill that right there. That's how much space you got. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. Couldn't be out. You would. You're not gonna cut through. You're not gonna get that cartilage. So yeah. Because yeah. it's and everybody starts a little bit different and some people are more prominent oh, than others. So it'd be really hard to feel that on a child or. Is it? Well, yeah, because I mean, it's like it's like so close. Yeah. Yeah. Some uh, other way. I mean, the way I show it is usually I just go you know, straight, straight cut in there. Like I said, when it comes to an infant, you just want to find a landmark. You're putting a needle in there. That's all you're doing. Cat catheter in there. That's the best way to do it because we're not going to be able to cut. We're going to do too much damage cutting. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, so <laughs> you know, I think uh, actually I learned this from kind of, you know. Air Force PJ guy, he told me the way they did it, they pull the skin up, get their uh, shears, snip, just fall apart, and then they can see it. You know, some people say get the step one, cut down that way, you can do it, but I like this way. You know, it's like, it's emergent, snip, and that there it is. is. Hmm. Oh, that's cool. So you can just snip and then still slice over? Or you well, just cut the skin. You just, you just cut the skin and, and then lays apart, and then you can see, you know, you can see what you're doing. A little like circle, a square triangle. Yeah. So anyway, know your anatomy. Understand this is short. It's quick. It's precise. It's an incise. We're not sawing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually more like boom. You're in, and that's it. You might. Some people, I mean, the way I do it, I'll say twist and just flip the blade over. But you don't want to sit there and do too much. Uh, work quickly, again, have a plan, 90% of this is all preparation. In fact, even it's kind of interesting, the, uh, the testing sheets all behind this, I always found ironic, they always say start ventilating the patient prior. I'm not, you know, like state sheets. It's like, if I have to ventilate, I'm not worried about doing this, yes. but <laughs> yeah. you want to say you, you know, gave an attempt. But uh, yeah, get ready for, and again, like I said, the case <coughs> will go bad, we'll get ready for plan B. It happens. I mean, at that point, what's plan? If you're already at that, what's plan B? In all seriousness, drive fast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fast. Yeah. occlusive drifting as well. I mean, yeah, you're pretty much as well on that one. I mean, there's no going back. Doc, we messed up. Guess what I did with your license today? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good way to send an email. Dear doctor, guess what I did with your license? Sorry about the 15 years of school. If that ever happens to me, I will be calling Jason. I mean, plan B was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be. Yeah, now my plan B is: will you have fries with this? Yeah. I need bail money. That's exactly, that's very relevant, Joe, right? <laughs> Who knows? We can, go, we can go over 12 leaves. <laughs> la, 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 la. That comes up, we'll deal with that then. And we'll take a break. <laughs> yeah, watch these videos at home since the internet here is like moving slower than evolution today. Uh, needle crike, same thing. Same thing as a trach, as a, just a cracking the trach, but the other thing we're doing is needles, and we're using needles for children. And the idea is we usually probably use like a 14 gauge needle. We're going to put it in, we stick it in. We're going to aspirate, make sure we're in the right place. We're going to advance the catheter. We're going to pull out. We're going to get one of those little adapters for the BBM on a, like a 2.52. It's a 15-22 adapter. Put it on top of there, and 
we're gonna have to, really we're gonna have to force air into it. We're gonna watch our chest rise, good enough, take it off, let the chest deflate. Same thing though, just make sure you tape that down good, lots of blood. We don't want to lose that at all. You can actually do this with a uh, an adult too. You know, last last ditch effort. But thing is put two of them in. So after you inflate, it has two ports to leave. But I mean for, these are last, last, last ditch efforts. So <laughs> There'll be a little bit of sweating, just a little bit. Anyway, multi-lumen devices or supraglottic airways, as they're now referred to. <laughs> you know, we got the Combi Two. Uh, don't worry about the PTLA; that's pretty much gone. But I uh, think your does your book talk about the King LT? Have they really brought that in yet? Mm -hmm. it's, our, it's in there. Yeah, it was. I don't think it was in the last. Uh, I don't know if it was the previous edition or not. Uh, LMA, uh, EOA. Uh, no, again, ancient relic there. I didn't even see it. I thought I saw it, but you like the acronym, but I didn't see it. But actually, I had to Google it to see what it was. It's, it's ancient devices, man. Ancient devices. For example, like a National Registry had that used to be able to test on a dual lumen airways. It would be like this and the combi tube. Well, this is pretty much gone. The combi tube is still around, so they said, okay, well, we'll use superglottic airways. So just combi tube and KLT? Mm -hmm. okay. So. Are they still used in the field? They're try they have been making some the manufacturers have really always trying to make a push for an LMA in the field. But LMAs do not <coughs> they just don't work. I mean they can just get dislodged too easy. I'll show you what we're talking about here in a minute. Combi tube, we stick it down, we're gonna go to one two place, esophagus or the trachea. Either way we win. That's the nice part about it. So Yay! <laughs> Plan B. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember the problem with the copy tube. It's just it's very you know this only comes in two sizes. You know is it the four and a half to five feet and like five and a half feet up and that's it and that's all you're gonna get versus like a King LT you can get in all sizes now. So obviously with things anything goes down the esophagus if you got history of you know cirrhosis esophageal varices alcoholism. Ingested corrosive substances, we don't want that stuff coming back up. We'd rather just let it sit in your belly and let somebody else deal with it. But uh, they used to refer to these as rescue airways. Now they're kind of just calling them advanced airways. This was a rescue airway for us when I started. We were like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So you would use that after, or if you couldn't do it with ET? I actually had one time we couldn't get an ET tube on this guy down in, uh, down in Austin. And I remember my partner, I mean, he was just trying so hard to shove that thing in, but it was that whole short, fat, narrow neck, neck thing, and it was just, the guy went to respiratory rest and died, <coughs> and it was just like, I mean, you just see them, and, he, and this guy's, you know, big guy, I, I can't get this further in. It's like, no, we can do here, man. So, again, know the advantages, combi tube, no special equipment, this, you know, not need sniffing position, that's kind of the nice thing about these things, just open and go. Same thing with the king, open and go. The, the things, these things will have little uh, nuances to them, like when you put in the combi tube, you have to make sure you go to the teeth, uh, the, the, the top teeth are in between two black lines, and then when it inflates, they're fine. The uh, king LT, obviously we're talking about that, you put it in, you just want to make sure it's seat back, so it stays in and includes the oropharynx and so forth. So... Um, yeah, don't be sticking these things down on conscious patients, please. So, this is the LMA. Again, this is this thing works really, really well in the OR, and I think we got a better picture here. But this is how it sits. It goes along the roof of the mouth, and it goes down, and it includes <coughs> the esophagus, and then it's just you know we got you know this whole bevel part. Um, right here that just is, okay, this tip includes the esophagus, this part here is right there open to the trachea. That's how it's designed. It looks nice, it looks neat. Problem is, you bounce around, it doesn't take much for that thing to slip and move. So it, that's that's the problem is they've really tried to force this in the field. The manufacturers are really trying to push this, but the thing is, it's just not stable. Now they have a thing now out there called what they call intubating LMA, which is about a good nice $800 piece of equipment. It does the same thing, but you can introduce a, uh, an ET tube, and it'll, you know you're going straight into the trachea. So, but when you look at the, you know, 
you know, those EMS services, like do we want to have an $800 piece of equipment or, you know, like what, the $20 or $50 King LT in multiple sizes and colors? Yeah. So the, the tip of that pushes out the upper legs, is that what you're saying? No, or it, just, it, it slides it's... down and it just uh, includes the esophagus, oh. is all it does. Oh. It doesn't do anything with the epiglottis at all. I'm sorry, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I said, it's great for... Um, it's great for the OR, but it's like I said, they've been trying to push it. I mean, I'll show you how to use it. It's kind of neat to use. You'll get the OG1 in the OR, so forth. So that's all I do. See? That's the, that's the, uh, this is the intubating LMA. But see how it just kind of slips down? Then they just inflate it. And like I said, all this part here is open straight to the trachea, but with the intubating, you just induce a tube and you're in. Illuminating stylet, um, it's not widely used because it's expensive. And all this is, is you just put the tube around that and you go in there and once you put, you know, you get your blade, you put it in there, you'll see a little glowing come out here and you know you're there. If you don't see any glowing, you're not where you're supposed to be. Then you just pull that back and you're fine. Yeah, it's a little going spot. Okay, RSI. The big thing you need to understand about this, there are pieces to RSI. It's everything with intubation except we're going to be using drugs. So when you're prepping for RSI, you're doing everything else, and you're also making sure you got the right drugs all set up. Okay? That's the big, big difference. And understand with RSI, it's you're taking away the right to breathe. That's a little problem with it, okay? First thing you want to do is what they call give an induction agent, and it's usually some kind of benzo. We give some kind of benzodiazepine because we want it. We don't want them to remember this. People will sit there and say, well, give them fentanyl because they see people in the ER and the OR give them fentanyl, but understand fentanyl is for pain. Fentanyl does not take away bad memories. We don't want them to remember anything. Okay, and with that being said, when we do this, first thing we're dropping is the induction agency. We don't want to remember. You give them a paralytic, and you have no induction agency. They are awake, the, and they are aware of what you're doing, and they just cannot move. So, not a pleasant place to be. Yeah. You see, see his eyes are open. <laughs> they, they, didn't, they did it backwards. No, they didn't. Was it? Yeah. No, I, yeah, I saw that. That happened up there, too, when I was there. They... Uh, Actually, I was a patient I too. They put him, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, I was, uh, I was doing a critical care rotation in there, and they're like, hey, you want to do this tube? I'm like, yeah, sure. Go in there and do the tube. It's like, doc's like, would you go over there and just double check, make sure everything's okay? I go over there and see this lady's wise, eyes wide open, crying. And I'm like, yeah. Oh. Uh, I wrote her, I'm like, uh, dude, she's awake. She is snowing out, but she's awake. And all of a sudden, I came back, and the nurse's like, oh, yeah, I just gave him some propofol, you know, but it's like, nurse blew it off. So I understand, like I said, they're awake. You can't do anything. So anyway, we're going to give them an induction agency. We want them to go nighty night. We want them to forget. We make them to forget. They go nice and sleepy time. Um, ideally, we want to give them, like I said, a benzo. We'll give them a little narcotics, you know, just for pain anything. The other ones that they use here uh, are these anesthetics or uh, some that refer to as hypnotics, automidate. Uh, you guys are familiar with propofol, right? Michael's milk? Yeah. That's what killed Mike, yeah. You know. What? Propofol? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Yeah, that's what killed Mike, yeah. You know, Mike, it's, propofol's white. That white stuff goes in, and they say, they say count from 99. Yeah, as soon as, as soon as you feel it, you're done. But, uh, same thing with Atomidate, too. Um, <coughs> and, uh, the other one is ketamine. Ketamine is usually on reserve for kids. The problem with ketamine is more of a dissociative anesthetic. So you're like, when the thing that they found out, this is actually called Special K for you guys out there. De Russ. <laughs> Damn, now I know what I'm selling. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, this is a, usually they see us like on horse for, you know, for like horse tranquilizers and stuff. But yeah, this is this like makes you totally dissociate, makes you think you're in La La Land. Great for kids, right? 
because they don't think about things too much. But what if you're like an adult under a lot of stress with family bills and everything, and you dissociate and you get trapped dealing with that? It's a bad trip. That's a bad. <laughs> 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 Came from the man. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> So the other thing, after we get them all nice and snowed out, we're going to give them a neuromuscular, neuromuscular blockade. And we're usually we go from a short acting, and then once we're successful, then we put in the uh, intermediate to long acting. The idea is we give them a short acting, like a, what is it, like a succedocholine, or uh, like, like the other ones, like rocuronium is another one, very short acting, like within five minutes, after five minutes, it's done. Is that a short or long? Intermediate. It takes about 20, 30 minutes. But the idea is that if we screw up, at least they'll wear off and they'll start breathing again. Is that like, do you carry in the field? Or is that what we usually just carry in the field, is short acting, in case we do screw up? Uh, I don't remember what you guys carry. Oh, I'm just saying. Yeah, usually, got, yeah, usually got both, you know. <laughs> you, would want, you want to make them, you know, go to sleep and then do what you need to do, and then do that afterwards? Or what's Snow them out, induction agent, right. snow them out. Short acting, paralytic. Okay. Once we're successful, we follow up with the intermediate to long acting. Okay. If we're not successful, we just have to wait for the short acting to wear off. Okay. Okay? That's, That's what I was going to ask you. I was like, we take over the airway, and it's like, like you said, you know, there's just times you cannot get an airway. It's like, well, what now? Yeah, this is one of those, you know, make sure you got your ducks in the row. You don't want to screw this up. You know, I mean, I, I mean, things will go bad. I mean, it happens, but like I said, it's. You want to make sure that short acting is in there because if whatever respirations they have, you want it to come back because you couldn't get that tube or whatever. Or you might have to sit there and say, hey, you know, at least they're snowed out. We can put a combi tube or something or, you know, something of that nature, but, or King LT. But like I said, you don't want to just take the breathing away and, you know, and not have a really good secure airway. So. But the whole point of, again, with the paralytic is, like I said, they, they're breathing, we've got a gag intact, it's, you know, respiratory rest again is imminent. Again, this is kind of like I said, what replaced nasal intubations. All the reasons that we were finding people to nasally intubate, got replaced with this. You know, we want to, we want to, you know, beat them before they lost all their oxygen reserve. Okay, we'll do this. Combative, agitated, you know, snow out, head injured, pick your, you know, poison there. The other thing you got to worry about is if they're, uh, have allergies to any specific medication, which is going to be very, very hard because usually by the time, most of the time you're doing this, they're usually not no, with it. it. You know, once in a while you might get that real bad respiratory. They'll be like, maybe they'll tell you something, but most of the time, no, they won't. The only thing you've got to worry about, the really ones you've got to worry about is really a succedylcholine. And a succedylcholine is what they call the deep polarizing uh, paralytic. And uh, you understand a little video I said, like thing about fasciculations. All it does, it comes down and depolarizes the muscle. So it comes down, latches onto the neuromuscular plate, and it says, okay, discharge, 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 and nothing else comes through. You know, no more acetylcholine is going to be able to come through here. The thing is, it also kind of drops a lot of potassium. So if you have a high potassium issue, just because we're depolarizing a cell, you kick out potassium. They're always concerned about that. And the same thing with burns, too. With burns, you get a high potassium floating around and and so forth. The other thing with was, was succedocholine, you get what they call malignant hypothermia. And happens again, it's like 1% like of the populace. I mean, their temperature just skyrockets high. There's an actual antidote for it. Most ambulances don't carry it, though. So just be cautious with it. The uh, non depolarizing, they just go and cap everything off to what's there and won't let anything go through. But it won't, deep, like I said, it won't cause articulations or muscle contractions at all. So, anyway. Like I said, it takes away their power to breathe, and what would be difficult, now you've got control over it. You've got 100% control. Just remember that. So they're not going to resist you. They're not going to fight you. They're not going to spasm. So make sure you got everything ready to go. Got, you know, get your equipment ready. You, you know, you sizes up that airway six ways a Sunday, and boom. So like I said, the big thing is it acts at the uh, neuromuscular junction where acetylcholine would allow nerve impulse transmission. Like I said, it blocks it. It just blocks it, locks up those channels. So no acetylcholine can come through and cause depolarization, cause movement. You know, this is just all somatic tissue at that point.
And like I said, this a neuromuscular blocker does not provide sedation or amnesia or anything. So, like I said, you don't give them the induction agent, they're aware of exactly what you're doing and they cannot fight you. I mean, they are truly just trapped at your mercy. So, and like I said, the aspiration during procedure, again, no reflexes intact. Um, you know, side effects again are to the specific drugs, so. Again, here are your neuromuscular blockers. I know you guys have done some quizzes on them. Be very familiar with them because if you, we start practicing in there and I say, you know, what's your dosage for this? I will expect you to know your dosages. Always know your drugs. Always know your dosages. Always, 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 always. But same thing. Get all your equipment. Make sure you oxygenate your patient. Make sure you got your drugs drawn up. You know, and again, you go in order. You know, same thing, like you just intubate, you're getting ready to intubate, except you drop your drugs, boom, boom, boom. You know, some, you might, in some cases, you might actually end up dropping more drugs like atropine and uh, lidocaine, but that's, we'll talk about that further on down the road. But like I said, make sure you got your induction, make sure you got your, your short term, make sure you got your, then after that, you can worry about your intermediate to long term at that point. But that's the only difference, so we're going to make sure those drugs are drawn and give them at the right time, and we're done. That's all so there's to it. to have two or three people hmm? This usually, like you're saying, you know, well, and have all this stuff ready. Has, you know, I was taught to do this by myself. I don't know if that tells you anything, so it can be done. So it depends. A lot of times they try to get more, you know, they'll try to get, you know, pull over to the side, make sure somebody else helping you, which is probably the safer thing to do. But I'm kind of I'm still under the opinion of, you know, what you might be by yourself when this happens. So get used. If you can get used to doing stuff by yourself, like we do in here. The extra help will be so much easier on you, you know, because then you're like, okay, you just take care of this, and I can do this, this. But you got to be get used to that. You understand the full procedure if you have to run it by yourself. How do you draw drugs if they're like already going downhill? Is that just kind of like? Well, if I was working with you, for example. Well, here by yourself. No, I mean, that's what I mean. There's, I mean, what I mean by myself, there's no. Um, you're the only paramedic. That's what oh. I mean. I thought you were talking like no, yeah. You're, you're, sorry, sorry. you're running the cold. Like, dude, if I, yeah, there were some days I actually worked with people. It felt like that, but no, that's what I mean by if you're by yourself, you're the only paramedic. All right, okay. which can, like I said, which can happen. Did you? Oh, yeah. Um, on the medication, the dosaging is in kilograms. You know, point zero five or point zero two, and um, and it's two point two. Pound two times it by two point two two point two pounds if you're trying to get the take the weight. What's an easy way to remember? Is it half minus ten percent? Yeah, yeah half pounds do. minus ten percent. That's your kilos. Yeah. The, I mean, we don't have to know the the weight the, divided by two minus like a few more few more points. How about that? Weight divided by two. It's because I mean, what you're doing is your weight. Your whatever you think this person's weight is divided by two point two. Oh, right, right. So if you think, you know, like, he's probably what? Is it fair to just divide it in half? And is it, and on, and on the drugs, it, is it better to be a little less than a little more? Be as accurate as possible. And the thing is, just remember, uh, just the best way I can answer that question is just remember, what you put in, you can't pull out. So just try to be as accurate as possible. You don't want to, I mean, it, it's never going to be an exact. So it's weight divided by two what? 2.2. 2. 2.2. Pounds divided, whatever that person's weight in pounds, divided by 2.2. And that's a lot and of things. that's how much we get them. How much they are in kilograms. That's how much they are in kilograms. And then kilograms per, Yeah. Actually, after a while, you won't even look at people and say, oh, yeah, this person looks like they weigh about 180 yeah, pounds. You're going to be like, eh, probably about 95 kilos. That's good enough. So you just kind of get change that conversion. Yeah, yeah you're probably about eh, 25 kilos or you know, 30 kilos, kids. You know. So just that's another little practice thing you can do when you're you know milling around, looking at people and say, well, if they look about this, well, what's, what would their weight be in kilograms? I love this. Actually, I should say perfection is not an option. Yeah, I was like, I bet you put this slide up here. No, actually, I didn't. Mine, mine would be perfection is not an option. It's the minimum standard. <laughs> yeah. What? Ouch. I don't see the problem with it. All right, last, I think we're at towards the end here. Needle thoracostomy. 
basically the big thing here, we are looking for signs of tension pneumothorax. What are signs of tension pneumothorax? Decreased blood pressure. Okay. What kind, of, what kind of decrease in blood pressure? What kind of decrease? Is it the paradoxes? No, that's not, no. no. <laughs> Be very, very uh, on speed on, you guys need to look up on what signs and symptoms of attention pneumo, okay? A pneumo is no, pneumo, realistically, a good 30% pneumo, they're not gonna do anything for. They're gonna just kinda wait it out and let them reinflate by itself. You can have a patient that, I mean, I, you can have a patient with a pneumo. Actually, can I ever tell you about this, the guy who I had pop his lung? Okay, this is a good story. So, you get called, this guy, he gets, you know, sits there and uh, <coughs> he calls up because it's like he's got this pain in his... Uh, you were in the scenario, but after yeah. American Tall. Yeah. 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 Uh, did anybody else have the pneumo? Uh, mm -mm. You know anyone? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, this guy's about 45 years old. We get over there. He, like I said, African, uh, African male, and he said, "There's like, yeah, I've just got this. I got this pain right here on my, you know, my, you know, right side of my chest." And just, I was like, "Okay." He's like, "Yeah, I just, you know," and and I can tell him he's got like his little pack of new ports and all this other stuff going on here, smoking and all this business. Like, yeah, you know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you get those pains from smoking. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, this feels different. I don't know what it is, you know. And it's like, yeah, it just really hurts in there. Anyway, I listen to his lungs. I'm like, I'm not hearing anything. He's going like, tapping, tapping. And I'm like, oh, this guy popped a lung on me. I mean, he actually popped his entire lung. But the whole time is we're getting in the hospital. We're taking emergent. I'm like waiting for something to happen. Nothing ever happened. I never had the signs of a ten went go tension on me. I'm like sitting going to tension. Like I said, they're going to have that real bad tachypnea. The pressure is going to go below 90. That pressure is usually a big giveaway right there. You know, like the kidney is right there, the air hunger, and so forth. Like, so when we start looking at JVD, and especially trach deviates, we're looking at late, late signs. But, like I said, if we're going to go tension, we got to make sure we have tension. Just because you have pneumo, you have a pneumo. You know, that's just, you know, we can, that's, hey, if it's not, you know, again, it's not, you know, if it's not a bad thing, let's not make it worse. So, but yeah, that's so, the thing is. And the tension, or in, I guess in the pneumo itself, you have the air between the plural, yeah. plural spaces. So then does that make the pressure on the outside and the inside the same, and that's why it won't? Yeah, it's got pressure. It can't inflate. It can't inflate. Yeah, it's got a bubble, basically. Okay. And the thing is also with smoking, the lung tissue, It what happens, it thins out. Okay. Let's figure it out. Okay, let's say we're looking at a slice. Of your uh, of your visceral uh, tissue here, tish, uh, tissue here, tissue here. But what happens is you get these little things called blebs, and the tissue actually thins out like this. So you actually, you know, you get you know you're breathing, breathing. You one layer. You know, and it pops. Yeah, that's that nice. See, that's that nice thick layer. It should be, but blebs are these like little bubbles that are popping, and it pops, and your lung collapses on you. So, you know, just a little FYI. Appreciate that. That's what I'm here for. So anyway, make sure uh, cardiac arrest, asystole, those are very, uh, well, make sure, you know, you're really suspecting that. Well, probably won't matter if they're cardiac asystole, but you listen to low sounds if your one's absent, dart the chest, see what happens. But obviously don't just dart the chest for no reason. I saw first time I was here, the first national registry test I had, I was doing the trauma station, and I saw like half people come through and it was like a stable pneumo, no big deal. But everybody was thinking, well it's a pneumo, it's a pneumo. And in fact I remember one person was like, Oh yeah, yeah I'm gonna do this, yeah, okay. I give oxygen, what happens? Well saturations go up. Oh yeah, this any other okay. I think I'm gonna dart the chest. Okay. Failed. Why? Huh? Why if the O2 sets were okay while dart the chest? Just that's the, that, that's so the, those you, are those little traps they want to see how much are you paying attention? So thing. when you have a pneumo lung pops and the tension is just when you breathe in all the air and it cannot escape. Well, if you just have well, a same thing with it. So same thing with the simple pneumo too. But it, how does it? Is it like like you said it was stable? Like does that necessarily mean like you're get you're having air come in and not being able to escape? It's it. What I'm saying. What I mean by stable? It's you know uh, yeah you've got you just your pr pressure hasn't built up. It, it, the pressure isn't causing any problems. Okay. 
you know, like I said, that guy, he had a complete, you know, his lung completely deflated. But it wasn't, like I said, he was, was still stable. I mean, yeah, his vitals were stable, he's talking, his color right. was good. And of course, as soon as they gave him the ER, they gave him a bunch of her said, cut a big hole, psh, you know, put a chest tube in him. Will that side be, like, really, really hard or distended or hard or anything? Or no, it's in the ch it's in the chest cavity. You're not gonna. You gotta be able. I know. To, we just I mean, just like tapping on it. We, yeah, it'll sound like. A, um, well, you'll hear like you know. Like, it just sounds. It'll just sound a, a lot higher pitch. That's a big difference. But yeah, just understand you're sticking a needle in someone's chest. Usually about a 14 gauge needle. It's not as bad as a crack. We don't call you that much. Oh, it, you're gonna still answer questions. It's like right below a crike. <laughs> you know, there's crike, you know, you know, darting a chest. How about that? So understand, you know, signs and symptoms. Be very, very, very familiar with these, please. So severe respiratory distress, absent uh, unilateral bunk, lung sounds, resistance to manual ventilation. That's always a good one. You know, I've, I've suffered a lot of people on that one, and I'll sit there and say, oh yeah, tell your tell your partner that you're having a hard time ventilating. It's getting hard, harder. It's getting harder. They'll be like, what's going on? What's going on? And like, they already blew the lung, you know, like a, you know, 20 minutes ago. So cardiovascular collapse. Again, there's that pressure dropping. You know, all that intra, intrathoracic pressure is, you know, it's occluding all your great vessels. You're not, your cardiac output is just tanked on you. Asymmetric uh, chest expansion. That's kind of hard to see sometimes, especially when you're kind of moving and grooving. But uh, understand, you know, restless anxiety, you know, understand JVD and trach deviation is late, late. Basically, all we're going to do is we're going to find the second intercostal space, midclavicular. This is the only thing, especially with the left side, because we don't want to have to uh, puncture any vessels, right? That thing. Anyway, we're going to go over, actually over the uh, rib there, over that third rib, because if we go under it, we're going to hit artery vein nerve. That sits into the rib. Bad thing. We don't want to cause damage, right? We're going to come in, we're going to insert, pull it out, decompress, play, put a stop, three-way stop cock on it. Now we can have a little bit more control. These things can get occluded just because obviously went to tissue and there could be blood glue and everything else into there. We might have to put a couple of them in line. So just a couple of needles? Yeah, a couple more needles. So yeah, just withdraw the needle and just secure it like an impaled object. That's all there really is to it. And like I said, you've got it, you know, even if you've already got an already a sucking chest wound, you've already got cover. And like I said, it's just, you know, you can't, you know, burp that sucking chest food. That's something you can control. And like I said, you got that stopcock on there. Like I said, breathe, breathe, breathe. We ventilate, ventilate. Everything's okay. We close it up. We have problems again. Open up that stopcock. See so if we can, you know, push that air right back out. So this is kind of your plan, plan B. If you put up inclusive dressing, you can't burp it, like you said. Mm -hmm. Or like I said, it's a spontaneous pneumo. There goes tension. I mean, there you go. Which can happen, too. Or, you know, just a traumatic injury, and it's not even sucking chest wound, it's just a bunch of rib fractures. Bad flail mm -hmm. chest. So. Begin by palpating the anatomical landmarks. Anterior needle thoracostomy occurs in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line. To identify the second intercostal space, first palpate the sternal manubrial joint in the anatomic midline. The second rib articulates with this joint. The second intercostal space lies below the, angle of the second rib. The actual notch. The needle insertion occurs over the superior surface of the third rib. Yeah, check these on. Yeah, check these on your own computer. This internet, our internet's going just way too slow. <coughs> Last one we're talking about is chest escherotomy. These are basically from burns, and pretty much the burn is restricting either your breathing or maybe it's a circumferential around your wrist and it's causing compartment syndrome. This is just not. Usually, a lot of times you have to call a med controller because usually there's no standing order behind this. But all we're doing is we're going to make a big laceration 
So it splits open and we can have chest expansion. Like I said, if we get a good burn, like I said, we're going to have restricted movement at that point. So we're just going to right down it, flay the tissue open, and hopefully we can start relieving pressure that way. You know, intubate if already, prep the site, clean it, you know, vertical incision, horizontal only if necessary, cover, protect. But like I said, we're tearing tissue to make space, you know, create movement. Oh, Saturday's class, we'll talk about here. Any questions?